FX Medicine is your gateway to news, resources and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Visit fxmedicine.com.au to sign up for e-news and stay up to date with the latest research, podcasts and industry information. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line today, again, is Rachel Arthur. Rachel Arthur has had many wonderful teachers and mentors over the last 20 years, including Dr. Tini Gruner. Each of Rachel's past and present mentors have fed her passion for critical thinking and independent education in naturopathy, making it a major focus in Rachel's ongoing career. She contributed a decade of teaching naturopathy across SSNT, Endeavour, Monash University, Victoria University, and lastly, Southern Cross University. And I warmly welcome you, Rachel, back to FX Medicine. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Andrew. Now, today we're talking about lovely little greeblies. We're talking about worms. We are. But particular the conversation types. that nobody wants to have. <laughs> but particular types of worms. And, like, I don't know how you nut this down, but let's talk first worms. Okay, so the reason I'm going to be talking to you about it at all is, as is often the case, you know, um, this was my clinical encounter, so to speak. I had (laughs) several clinical encounters with horrible worm infestations in children. And I thought, what do I know? What don't I know? And there was a lot more that I didn't know. Um, I really couldn't understand why I was seeing a raft of patients who effectively had treatment-resistant threadworm. So, you know, everybody says go get some, you know, OTC worming product and they'd done that and done that and done that and the little blighters were still there and the problems were getting worse and worse in these kids. So that was a long time ago now and you know, it triggered my interest about worms in general, individual susceptibility, complementary medicine approaches, of which there's very little in the research. And then I started thinking, gosh, who else is this affecting? And then that opens up a whole new chapter that I've been delving into over the last couple of years. So they were non-responsive to the usual thing that people get off the shelf is mabenazole. So what the classic story was, you know, and, and uh, you know, and it's much broader than this. But but to go back to the, the inception of my fascination, my morbid <laughs> fascination with worms, was yeah. really that um, I had a series of families come in in dire straits, really, because their kids didn't present with itchy bottoms. Maybe they did, but that was such a minor concern. What these children were presenting with were often gross neurobehavioural disorders. Mm. So nothing, they went on the spectrum, there was nothing like that, but the instability of the mood was drastic in a lot of situations. Um, The sleep disorders were extreme. Um, And, you know, mum and dad are sitting there saying, we don't understand. No one else in the family has these. We're absolutely certain. We've wormed everybody. Um, But it wouldn't matter how many doses we give this child, whether it's a girl or a boy, the the worms never go away. Um, Or they go away, but but just really briefly. But often by the time they come to see me, it was completely non-responsive to the -the over-the-counter worming agents. What about immune response in the child? What about... um... You know, is it because they were poorly fed? Is it because they were yeah, mal- yeah, great malnourished? Question. Great question. I think some of the biggest myths, because, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, good old-fashioned um, threadworm here, or, you know, some people refer to it as pinworm. Yeah. Um, its real name is Enterobias vermicularis. And when when we, I think one of the biggest myths about that is, A, it only happens to kids, B, it only happens to dirty kids, or see it happens in poor poor regions, you know, and all of those are absolute nonsense. Um, you know, these are kids that were well-fed, incredibly well-cared for, 
um, and didn't necessarily have immune compromise in other areas, not at all. Um, what not not to begin with, shall I say? I'll, I'll get to that perhaps a little bit later about what chronic worm infestations actually do to the immune system. Um, but no, this, this was a the you know this was a collection of children that just shouldn't have had this. Should not have had a problem with resolving worms. Life cycle vector. What was yes. the vector? Where did this greebly come from? Okay, so one of the other big completely misunderstood things about threadworm is everybody thinks, oh, it's coming from the animals. It's not coming from the animals. The only host on the planet that we understand for uh, threadworm is actually humans. We're it. We're it. (laughs) That's deeply disconcerting because we're looking for somewhere to live. Um, So it's not coming through our pets. It's not coming through the soil. It's not coming through contaminated uh, you know, regions that we live in, so to speak. Yeah. Um, there is, you know, a discussion about vectors and, and things like that. You know, there's, there's certainly some relationship with Diantamoeba fragilis, um, but the relationship is the other way around. It's the threadworm eggs that have been found in many instances to contain Diantamoeba fragilis. So you could actually have recurring defrag infestations secondary to actually right. enter a bias infestations, but not the other way around. We think threadworm is just literally hanging around uh, in the environment, not in the soil. It would be in the environment on things we touch, people we come into contact with, airborne, because we can inhale the eggs. Um, and, you know, they get inside us and they go, yippee. I'm home. So one of the concepts that I vaguely remember was this thing about um, retro infection, that if they, God, I hope I got this right, if they swallowed the drug mebenazole during a phase when the pinworm was outside of the anus, outside of the alimentary tract, that it could live for a few days there, the drugs pass through, metabolized, and then the egg goes back into the anus and reinfects. That's right. Is that correct? Yeah. So one of the things is that um, one, one thing that if we're talking about over-the-counter pharmaceutical worming, one of the details that is often missed by parents and practitioners is you're supposed to do it twice. Yeah. Um, because it, it's not even just a matter of the eggs outside of the gastrointestinal tract that are missed. It's that you know eggs are missed in general. So the drug is only effective against adult threadworm it won't actually touch the egg. Right. And the other thing about the drugs, both over-the-counter um, worming tablets, is that they have zero to less than 1% uptake. So they're not actually taken up into your bloodstream. They just literally sit within that tube that we affectionately call the gut, and that's where they do their business. So you're right. If you've got eggs sitting around the periangle area, they're not going to touch that. If you have threadworm, and I'm leading the witness here, Andrew, if you have threadworm anywhere else, in any body cavity, or right. anywhere else, they won't touch that either. Oh, really? So one of, Yeah, that's right. Oh. So one of the classic things that we say is, you know, remember that pharmaceutical drugs need to be taken twice, so they need to be taken the first dose, and then the second dose about seven to ten days after the first to catch that second dose cycle, if you like, to catch those eggs that have now hatched and become adults. Um, but there's a lot more to really preventing retro-infection than, than that because auto-infection, it's not just retro-infection, so retro-infection suggests that pathway that you just described, but auto-infection, which is any means by which you keep re-inoculating yourself, so you think about the child who loves putting their finger up their nose. Yeah. This is the same finger that's been scratching their wiping bum. their bottom, yep. that's been scratching their bottom unconsciously during the night. Mm. So putting their finger up their nose re inoculates themselves with the thread worm, sucking on their thumb, chewing their fingernails, all of those sorts of things. So there's you know, auto infection is huge and we know that this is one of the main reasons why you know, an infestation can become chronic, that it can actually go on for months and years 
because, you know, we're just never getting our head above water in terms of preventing those kind of re-exposure routes. But again, even in patients who I've seen who have done everything to stop retro-infection and auto-infection, we were still seeing chronic unresolving worms. So there's another part to that story. Well, I have to ask about another drug. So there was mebendazole, but there was also pyrantal, right. and, and that's the one that doesn't kill them but stuns them. Right. So do you favour the use of changing the drug or alternating the drug therapy? Mm, okay. Probably in a big chunk of patients, I find complementary medicine more effective. Right. Um, if we are describing this situation, right, if you came to me, Andrew, and you said, here's my child and this, they have worms and this is their first experience of worms, um, what are you going to do about it? I'd actually say go to the chemist, go get that over the counter. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be saying we've got to go the uh, complementary medicine pathway here. And there's a whole reason, you know, behind that. But if we're talking about the sort of, you know, complex, chronic, unresolving infestations that I'm describing, then um, complementary medicine has an enormous potential to be the circuit breaker. So that's one part of it. Do I think that changing up the drugs does much? Not unless you move to a drug that has systemic anti-worming actions. So that's not plantal powder. That's not, you know, the -the over-the-counter tablets. It's actually prescription-based anthelmintics that are absorbed from the gut get into your bloodstream and therefore will have an anthelmintic, um, you know, action some, you know, in, in, uh, in other parts of your body. Okay, so you mentioned these unusual signs and symptoms um, presenting uh, with an infestation. How do you tease them apart? Like how did you go, oh, I know what it is? Yes, okay. So that, um, it was a, a ponderous moment where I started to think, what is it that I'm seeing here? What's this pattern? What, what, you know, how do I know how to spot it earlier next time? I think that the symptom picture, you know, we all go, oh, you know, if they have an itchy bottom, yes, of course we get it. And if they don't, no, it's not. And that's probably the biggest mistake we make. Um, there's this assumption that you can't have worms without puritis A9. And that's completely incorrect. In fact, a large percentage of patients, particularly adult patients who carry the worms chronically, are asymptomatic and they don't have any symptoms. And isn't that worrisome? Mm. You know, that could be somebody in your house. Yeah, that's right. Um, But right. So, you know, I I talk about kind of the iceberg effect, you know, the, the, the stuff above the water that we all can see is the puratus and I, you know, the itchy bottom, we all go, we will get that. Or a secondary uh, infection or dermatitis around the bottom, we get that. And then I think you get down to the next level that, again, a lot of practitioners would pick up. Maybe it's the nose picking, the thumb sucking, the grinding of the teeth during sleep, the really disturbed sleep. Um, and, and as I said, that can get quite extreme. So the disturbed sleep might be that a child or an adult who calls out, who, uh, you know, is, is yelling out during their sleep, having nightmares, uh, you know, um, it might be that the bedding's all over the place in the morning. You can tell that, you know, they've done several somersaults during the night. It's, it's most often going to be flagged as well by an individual who wakes up unrefreshed in the morning. So, of course, there's lots of reasons that, or, or explanations behind unrefreshing sleep, but don't leave worms off your list. Um, I think that, you know, from there, we start to get into the areas that practitioners are less probably likely to link uh, with enterobias. Um, and that seems like um, vulval itching. So the little girl who talks about a sore vulva or an itchy vulva, a discharge. Um, something from the vagina, vulva yeah. vaginitis. Thirty percent of women, not little girls, women who think they've got thrush on testing are found to have actually threadworm. Wow. I know we haven't covered the how did it get there, so we've got to cover that entry. <laughs> yeah, you've got the proximity of the anus to the vagina, so there is that. That's all it is. That's all it is. If you think about that proximity, 
between the opening of the vagina and the opening of the anus. And if we think about it, first of all, in little girls, where the distance between those two openings is less than a centimetre. It's a matter of millimetres. And you're going, how hard would it be for a a female worm, which is coming out every night of the anus, to lay its eggs in the perianal area? How hard would it be for it to just do that millimetre further Mm. and and go, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, I found myself in another warm, moist place? Um, and then arguably as well in women, so not just in little girls where the distance is so small, but even in grown women, that distance really in non-pregnant women is quite small as well. In pregnancy, of course, that lengthens and extends, but still is only going to be a maximum sort of, you know, four centimetres. So again, how possible is it that the threadworm is going to migrate completely unintentionally, just trying to do its business and lay its eggs where they can hatch? Uh, into the genitourinary system, huge. Yeah. We know that this is the most common site of what we call extra intestinal infestations. Right. So you can, program can survive pretty much anywhere in the body. It, you know, if a, if a child has the eggs on their fingers and then, believe it or not, they scratch their inside of their ear, you can develop program in your ear. You can, there are reported case reports, lots wow. of them, in the ear, in the eye, in the nose, uh, in the salivary glands, you know, all over the place that yep. Yep. The, you've managed to, you know, infect yourself with. And equally, if not more so, because this is actually the most common place that they go to, of course, in girls and women, is they take up residence in the genitourinary system. And they survive very, very well there. So I, I'm going to so, guess here that it's squamous cell. I, I'm just trying to think about what cells it would live in and upon. And I guess it's different from a bacteria. Like, you know, you get um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, they go for columnar epithelium. But this is yeah. different, isn't it? Like this is an organism. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. wonder whether it would be, would be restricted to a cell type. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. All I know is that they're incredibly flexible, you know, in terms of the sort of environment that they can live in mm. um, and and thrive in. They don't just live and then die off. They're reproducing in those areas. So, okay, yeah. so there's, there's a big uh, conundrum for therapy because, hey, you don't get um, parental or a mebenazole uh, pessary. You don't. That's exactly right. And, and yet, you know, we have these patients, both little girls and mature women, who are going, um, surgery just wasn't on their radar. They thought they had thrush. They thought they had, um, for example, a UPI or even interstitial cystitis. Um, oh. They thought they had pelvic pain associated with, you know, ovarian issues and whatever. It's correlated with fertility issues. It has been shown to be a factor in miscarriage. And you're just going, wow, we need to wake up to this, that, you know, this is their second home yeah. for, you know, in a lot of cases. And none of the treatments that we're, our patients are going to reach for are going to address that. So how do you treat, particularly in, you know, an area that's quite sensitive in the, in the um, vaginal region, you don't yeah. want to be looking at things that are going to burn. You don't think that'll get a favourable feedback from your patients. <laughs> what, no. what, what do you use? Okay, so this is where I was at about eight years ago. I think it was longer, in fact, I think it was about 10 years ago when I was treating um, little girls in yeah. this situation. Yeah. And I was going, right, pretty sure they're in the genitourinary system because, you know, the, the kid, you know, this kid certainly, uh, I'd read the literature on that and thought, right, that's why we can't get rid of them, you know, with using OTC products. Um, and I thought, okay, where are the herbs? And I go literature searching, where are the herbs that, <laughs> that work against centre of eye? Um, you know, because I'll put them in a sitz bath or I'll do something, I'll make pessary, you know, like I'm going to treat locally because yep. that is the only way to address this. And when I went searching for the research that I just assumed was there, Andrew, lo and behold, there is almost nothing. 
you know, you might think, oh, surely Artemisia has been studied against centro bias. No. You might think, what about all those other kind of anti-parasitic herbs that, you know, we're fond of using in other scenarios? Nope. No. They haven't been studied. Now, that was, for me, was like, oh, gosh, I'm dealing with young girls. I'm asking their parents to do something and the girls to do something that, as you say, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be unnecessarily invasive. And I sure as heck better be effective, right? And I'm going and I have no research to to really, you know, in terms of herbal medicine to, to back me on this. You know, I'm really going, uh-oh. So one of the things that um, actually came up in my reading was, and actually it came from a throwaway line from a, an integrated GP that I shared care with at the time on, on different patients. And mm. I said, oh, you know, have you ever seen this? Have you ever seen just kids that cannot expel worms? And, um, you know, as a total throwaway line, he said, oh, check out chondroitin sulfate. And I said, right, chondroitin sulfate. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go find something on this. And what I came across was a, a collection of studies that have been done in vet science hmm. because, of course, worms are a big issue in vet science. And um, they were looking at, in much greater detail than we were looking at in humans, about what makes an individual of any species susceptible to infestation because the reality is we're all exposed to, say, something like threadworm, yeah. but it doesn't hang around for some of us. It just passes through. We just go, mm, no thanks, and off it goes out the other end. It doesn't set up shock. But in vet science, they were saying, okay, why some have a problem and others not? And so they'd looked at this in really exquisite detail and they'd really blown apart a lot of our misunderstandings about what an effective immune response was to worms. Because you probably remember, Andrew, we all were under the illusion, which we now realise is an illusion, that the way that the body resolved a worm infestation was via our eosinophils. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. Because that, yeah, that's the white cell that, that, that goes up. You can see it in the blood tests of all these individuals. So we, we all thought, ah, that, that's the immune system responding. Great. That's the immune system doing its job. What the vet scientists and now the scientists in, in human research are also echoing is that is not an effective immune response. The eosinophils, rather than actually resolving the infestation and helping with expulsion of the worms, hmm. are instead enabling the worms. They're encouraging, if you like, a symbiosis. So we're being hijacked. We're being hijacked, absolutely. Oh, my now, God. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know you and I will get to the point about what well, aren't worms good for us, but we'll get to that yeah. later. <laughs> but... So what these what came out of this research, and I'm going to cut it real short because you know there's just too much to detail to go into. But what came out of this research was the real effective immune response isn't with the eosinophils. It actually is really encapsulated in basophils. It's the basophils that do the work, and why the way that they Bell those worms or make the host, if you like, unfriendly to them setting up residence, is they secrete massive amounts of chondroitin sulfate and other oh. gags. And I was like, oh, okay, doctor onto something. Doctor not losing his mind, totally onto something. So I started reading up on this and, and, and in these animal studies, they were treating the animals with chondroitin sulfate and saying, now let's feed them worms and see what happens. And when they treated the animals with chondroitin sulfate, the worms wouldn't set up shop. And I was like, okay, this is as close as I've got to the best research right now. So these poor little girls, and I had some little boys at that time too in practice, that were chronically infested. 
And I thought, well, I'm, you know, completely sulfate safe. I'm going to give it a go. Now, it wasn't the only thing I did, but I'm absolutely convinced that it was one of the most important things that I did was give these individuals chondroitin sulfate. So the bigger question, of course, Andrew, is why would you have an individual who doesn't make enough for themselves mm. and so on and so forth? But that's probably beyond the scope of this, you know, discussion. But I can tell you that we resolved the worms. In each and every case, we resolved the worms, yes. Yeah. This is really interesting to me in that I remember some research done by um, Samantha Coulson, Dr. Samantha Coulson, on work with regards to chondroitin sulfate. And basically, we got it wrong that we think it's something for the joints. But I, I mean, I actually found a, a diagram which details how our body um, absorbs and, and digests, if you like, um, chondroitin and makes these downstream molecules that eventually they'll help our joints, but uh, initially mm. they are um, metabolized by our gut. So mm, it, it just, I, what you said, like it surprised me, but I'm the, f the more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm thinking this is actually a gut healing response. Yeah. And that immune response is really complex. Mm. It's a multi-step sort of process. And, um, you know, gags are, I mean, the gut is one of the primary producers of gags. You know, it's, we've thought of it in terms of tight junctions and things like that. But now this is really um, painting the scene, as you said, for, um, you know, gags is actually an immune response in the gut, a really important immune response. It really, you know, it really um, turned my assumptions and, and my training on its head. And I thought, you know, um, it was all good in theory um, to begin with, but I really needed the proof in my clients. Yeah. And then when I could get the proof over and over and over again, I was like, right, yeah, let's tear out those pages. Let's rewrite those, you know, sections in the textbook. Um, and let's all understand the, the truth about enterobias and you know, in all its wonderful colour. I remember a paper, and I think it was Greek, but it actually looked at a positive response from children infected or immune responses from children infected with pinworms. And I think we need to be clear on this about the botanical, mm. when I say the botanical name, that's a plant, the um, <laughs> binomial nomenclature, the actual organism that we're talking about. So we're talking about Enterobias vermicularis, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because some but, countries call threadworm and pinworm that's another, right. another thing. But they, they, well, yeah. I think what they saw in this paper was a decrease in allergies. Now, this comes yeah. back to, we, yeah. we're thinking about uh, eosinophils. This comes yeah. back to not a stimulatory response of eos, eosinophils at all. No, look, this is, I mean, this is so interesting because as I've been, trying, as I've been, you know, mentoring people and, and bringing this to them to the attention or speaking at conferences, of course, the first sort of protestation I get is, hang on, worms are good for us. And I go, ooh, mm. you might want to specify what you mean when you say worms are good for us. That's yeah. a bit like saying bacteria are good for us. Well, yeah. Yeah. there's a lot of species, uh, there's a lot of strains. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of increasing interest in this area about whether helmets are part of, you know, good gut The diversity. old friends, yeah. Yeah, and, and as you say, even going beyond that and saying, do they actually have some immune modulatory actions that are absolutely desirable? So the answer is yes, sort of. You know, in in some ways, in a person that where it's not causing an issue, you cause it. You you okay, have an so infection of the, them, and there's an infection. That's right. So yeah. that's the first thing. Like I said to you, you bring your kid into see me, and you go, "This is the first time they've had worms." I go, "Great, go treat that." Yeah. End of story. Um, you know, because um, you know, do I think enterobias is evil for all individuals? No, not at all. And um, there is some literature. There was a paper published last year by Yang which looked at the microbiome of kids without threadworms or without enterobias, kids with enterobias, and then kids after treatment of enterobias. And they actually found that kids without the threadworm actually had the lowest uh, microbial diversity in their gut. The kids with enterobias obviously had better diversity. Interestingly enough, the kids after treatment 
Sandro Bias mm. had even better diversity count. Oh. Yes. So there's, there's all this sort of, you know, it, it's too simplistic to say worms are good or enter bias is fine, you, you know, it's a symbiote or something like that. As you say, my first exception is I say, not if this child is presenting with a problem. Yeah, that's right. And or not if this, I, I should stop saying children, not if this adult, I'm seeing a lot of things in adults, not if this adult is presenting with a problem. I would no sooner tell those families that enterobias is a symbiote and they should do, or a commensal and just get over it, then, you know, walk in front of a truck. These people are living a, a horrible experience with their kids. Yeah. And, you know, who's going to argue with them that, that the helmet doesn't need to be eradicated? It does. It's got on top of this child. So that, that's a really important exception. And I think that, you know, there has been, you know, First of all, this general sort of, you know, um, concept that, that worms could be beneficial and worms could be good for our immune system, in particular, lowering T helper 1 and T helper 17 cell lines. And this is speculated to potentially lower risks of autoimmunity and in the future and um, also to, you know, reduce the severity of current autoimmune presentations. The stuff on allergy is totally at sixes and sevens, Andrew. Yeah. There is as much research saying that it is allergies as there is saying that it actually promotes allergies. Because if you if your response to a worm infestation is to make eosinophils, that, that's going to increase your allergic response, right? My old concept was that it would therefore, sorry, that it would react with eosinophil and therefore the and I'm going to be really vague here, but if you like, the energy given to the eosinophilic reaction would be taken up by that infection. But that's not necessarily yeah. the case. Not necessarily. The, the research is so complex and so patchy because it depends on, you know, I won't go into it, but, you know, the, the research is all, all over the place. Yeah. You know, it's in, you know, they've used different learning agents, they've used different follow-up times. Uh, as I said, some studies have shown reduced allergy development in those kids um, when their when their pregnant mums were treated for them, and some have shown increase. Um, so you know, I really don't think we can at this point say, you know, worms are good, full stop, um, and that we entirely know what worms are going to do, uh, you know, for the immune system. So this whole idea that they increase T helper 2, lower T helper 1, T helper 17, we've kind of established that, and it's not just enter a bias, of course, it's a range of worms that do that. But the worms are immunosuppressive. This is one of the, the absolute accepted truisms about worms. Yeah. You go, so, so what does that mean for somebody who does have a chronic infestation? You know, I said to you before about you know, these kids, and you said, did they have immune problems? And I said, well, not to begin with, mm. you know. But if you're carrying a chronic worm infestation, their impact on your white cell, you know, replication and the cell line, you know, proportion is is to induce a hyper-responsiveness to defending yourself against bacteria. And you go, mm, okay, I can, see, I can see a little bit of a problem. For some individuals, uh, I, I yeah. guess. I guess my issue with it is, if you are instigating or wanting to use any helminth therapy, when the human is the vector, i.e., it's a sideline thing that passes in and out but doesn't live in you, then okay, you know, let's let's potentially look at that. But if you've got something that where the human is the host, you better yeah. have a good terrain. Yeah. And, and this to yeah. me is what you're talking about. It, it's got to do with the terrain and how that person can handle or uh, ward off an organism passing through, setting up shop and becoming an infection and causing problems. That's right. That's what interests me, right. though, is the therapy, chondroitin. So if you're talking about yeah. vulval infection and things like that, how versatile have you used it? <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, it's very interesting. Look, um, as I said, the, the approach... It has to be multi-pronged. 
So, you know, I don't give them chondroitin and, and we're done. I, there, there's a raft of other things that we do, not just in terms of, um, you know, actual investives, but, you know, there's a lot of educating that we do about, you know, how to prevent all of those sort of, you know, re-exposure pathways and, and all of those sorts of things as well. When I was, to, you know, look, asking myself that same question, Andrew, I'm like, okay, so I use chondroitin sulfate and that seems to get rid of them, you know, quite convincingly. I'm like, well, how does that get? Is that really getting to the genital urinary system? Is that what I've changed there as well? You know, have I increased gags in the GU? So let's go back one step. You said chondroitin sulfate actually has poor bioavailability, which it does, okay? So it's not a, a, a molecule that we find very easy to absorb. So, you know, the percentage that actually gets into the system and gets to those other tissues is quite low. So I'm going, well, you know, am I really making a difference in oh, the genital yeah. system of these girls, yeah, yeah. you know? Um, then my research took me down the line of, the gags belong in the genital urinary system. Yeah. Like, what? Well, hang on, <laughs> I don't even have a reference point for this. Now, what's amazing to me is the, you know, increasing volume, the loudness of the research talking about the imperative role of gags in the genital urinary system of women. This has got nothing to do with worm research. Mm. This has got to do with, um, you might be aware that um, gags, particularly chondroitin sulfate, are being used in interstitial cystitis. Chondroitin sulfate is used in prolapse. Yep. Um, if you, and I'm like starting to get into the literature going, oh my goodness, here's another world. So, you know, my, my thought is, uh, you know, now I go, oh yes, yeah, Gags belong there. Our capacity to make gags, you know, at the gut, in the joints, in the genital urinary system, you know, this, this is going to be a big determinant of our ability to defend ourselves in this way. Can I tell you that giving someone chondroitin sulfate orally, you know, increases the gags in the genital urinary system? I can't. I can't, you know. I wish I could measure that. I wish I could say, you know, I know that that's what's happening. Um, I don't at this point. But, um, you know, we're exploring new options, new treatment options all the time and new um, modalities all the time. So watch this space. But I have had good results just through the oral administration. Oh, so we're not even talking topical application. We're talking nope. oral administration. Yeah, and, and again, it, it just... As you said, it challenges, you know, all these ideas, like, you know, your thing about there will never be bacterial translocation. Yeah. I've got similar ones. Wrong. You know, I thought, <laughs> how, how could probiotics ever get into the breast milk? Bom, bom. Anyway, you know, it challenges all these, you know, ideas that we have that are really simplistic. A, about where gags are and where they're important. B, about how we make them and how variable that our capacity to make them actually is, you know, and, and and see about what the impact is if we, we're not a good producer of gags. I mean, I'm just fascinated, you know, about what more this is going to teach us. Uh, look, this is absolutely fascinating, but I'm going to have to learn a lot more. Where can others learn a lot more? Because there's a lot more to learn. <laughs> there is a lot more to learn. Every time I talk about it, I think, oh, I think I'm done now. I think people get what I'm saying. You know, watch for worms, look again, you know, uh, you know, understand these new discoveries, off you go. But when I, I, I realise that, you know, m my knowledge is, is built on, as I said, about 10 years of reading into this and treating this, so I go, oh, okay, yeah, there is a bit. <laughs> there is a bit to know. So I am speaking at mind on this topic, yeah. um, women and worms. Um, at the Mind Conference in May. Um, and we also have a resource online called thewormwhisperer.com.au, yeah. which is primarily really um, there for the public because I tell you the outcry from the public is enormous in terms of their need for help and the gaps 
that are there at the moment in terms of getting help. Um, but, you know, a lot of practitioners would, would learn a lot by going on there as well um, and, and looking at some of the resources that we have on there also. And I would definitely urge all of our listeners, please get onto the website, click on mindd.org, look at the seminars and the events that are upcoming because you need to be at the Mind Forum. In 2018, it's the 11th to 13th of May. You need to get to this to help these kids um, in this instance with behavioural and neurological issues. Um, and you will be speaking indeed at this one in 2018, like you did last year. And i got to say, you were one of the key speakers at that event. You were brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. That's very kind of you. Well, well you were practical. You were, you were pragmatic. You are obviously an expert in clinical practice, but you have this knack for questioning, for uncovering and debunking assumptions. And you have, as you say, these many ponderous moments and you give those to us. Thank you so much for joining us on FX Medicine today. Thanks, Andrew. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Don't forget to visit fxmedicine.com.au for today's show notes, extra research and other resources.